In Psalm 23 it says this, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house forever. The 23rd Psalm is one of the best known, most beloved scriptures of verses, I think, of all times. You see it everywhere. People have it printed on shirts. People are posting it all over the internet. People have it written on placards in their house. When you go to the funeral home to say goodbye to a loved one, a lot of times you'll see this. If you go into the graveyard, written on the tombstones, sometimes you see, the Lord is my shepherd. It's a wonderful... David is describing a time, and he's describing the wonderful feeling he has with God by his side. You know, a lot of people think that David was older when he wrote this psalm. Because it takes an older person to appreciate what David's talking about. If you look down to verses 4 and 5, he says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Young man doesn't think about fearing evil in the shadow of the, or in the valley of the shadow of death. When you're 19 and you're 20, you're invincible. You can do anything. Older man to appreciate the shadow that comes with the valley of death. In verse 6, he says, The goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And at the house of the Lord is the tabernacle or the temple. When David was a young man, 2 Samuel 5 and 6, when he first becomes king, he's ready. He is more than ready to build the house of God. He wants to build the house of God. He wants to collect everything and he wants to put it together. It's only later in his life that he finds out he has shed too much blood. He is not the man to put together the house of God. To say that there is more about the character of God in this one passage, all the beauty and all the wonderful things about God in this passage would take up all day long. But there's one figure of speech in here that's gorgeous. And he says, verse 5, My cup runs over. My cup runneth over. You know it was a custom back a long time ago during this time. If you met somebody, you're wandering through the desert and you came upon tents, it was a custom that they would take you in. I mean, here you are wandering through the desert, hot, sticky, icky from the day's work and you wandered up on a tent knocked on the door they'd say come in and sit with me and they would put a cup before you now remember you're in the desert and this is a time long before they had the ability to store water well or wine well or anything along those lines and if the man if the host sat down and poured you a cup and you drank it and he didn't pour you any more, your welcome was done. If the host would pour you some wine or some water, and you drink it and he'd set the cup down, he'd pour you a little bit more, as long as he's pouring you a little bit more, you're still welcome. The third level of that was when you sat down and they put the cup before you, and the host would start pouring and would not stop. And in a place where water is at a premium, liquid is something that's not everywhere. When the cup starts running over, and they let it run over, 
It was a signal to the traveler, you are more than welcome. I have more than enough for not only me, but for you too. I've got, I've got more than enough for my family and your family. When that host is pouring out that wine and it's, and it's flowing over the cup, it signifies you are more than welcome in my house. Consider yourself part of the family. And what a wonderful figure of speech, that idea of the overflowing cup. When David uses this idea of the overflowing cup about God, he is showing us how he thought God was a generous God. How he looked at God and he saw this is the generous God of, the, this is my father. And he was wanting to show us God's generous nature. You know, God is very generous. It's in his nature to bless us. If you turn over in the Old Testament to 2 Kings 4, 1 through 7, you have a little story there about Elisha and a widow. And he meets the widow and the poor widow is destitute. And he says, I want you to collect every vessel you can. From everybody you can. She went around to her friends and her neighbors. And she said, give me bowls. Give me vessels. And when she had them all collected, he said, now you start pouring oil into those vessels. And she'd pour oil. And as long as there was something to pour oil into, oil came out. As long as she was pouring the oil, the oil continued. Eventually she came to the end. And he said, now you take all this oil and you sell it and pay your debts. You know, when she got done, don't you think she probably sat down and said, I wish I had a 50-gallon water pot. I wish I'd had an extra couple empty jugs of Milo sweet tea to fill up with oil. Because that's the nature of God. To be generous. To give more. More. If you keep going in 2 Kings over to verse uh, chapter 7. And from verses 1 to 16. You have the story there of Elisha. The lepers. And the Syrians. The Syrian army was coming up against the Israelites. And Elisha was trying to get them to. The, the, the captain of the Israelite army trying to get them to understand that tomorrow would be their day of salvation. And he said, tomorrow, wheat, it's going to be nothing, a penny, five cents for a, a, a pint of it. Tomorrow, bread is going to be sold for nothing, a pittance. And these people were surrounded. These people were starving. That night, the Syrian army was drawn, was driven away by the angels of God. And some lepers stumbled into it. Stumbled into the camp. Camp's empty. Here's some lepers wandering around because they're outside the city. They, got, they can't go in the bit for safety. And they wander into the camp. And what do they find? Everything but no Syrians. Gold, food, water, everything they could ever want. It's funny because at one point, one of the lepers is like, you know, if we don't tell somebody, we're going to get in trouble. If we don't go ahead and fess up to the fact that we found this, we're going to get in trouble. And God gave all that to the children of Israel. Saved them from sure destruction. Sure destruction. And the naysayer, the naysayer, he was trampled to death at the gates when the people found out he was killed and never could partake of the blessings keep going along and you get almost down to the death of Elisha in 2 Kings 13 14 through 19 right along in there while he's dying Joash the king comes to visit him and he wants to know what's going to happen and Elisha says take out your arrows and hit the ground. And he takes out his arrows and he goes. And 
Elisha gets mad. He gets really mad at him. He says, why in the world did you just hit the ground three times? If you'd hit the ground six, seven times, God would have driven the, the, the Syrians away from you. You would have been able to utterly destroy them. Uh, uh, actually, I think that's the Philistines at this point. You would have been able to absolutely destroy them. But since you only hit them three times, you'll not be able to destroy them. It was the nature of God. Each one of these stories show that the nature of God is to add blessings. To give us more blessings. To overflow our cup. Because that's what we want, isn't it? An overflowing cup. When you go, when you go to the New Testament, in Ephesians 3.20, it says this, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works with us, it shows us the fact that God is omnipotent. God is able to bless us more than we could ever want. All the blessings are in Him. All the blessings come from Him. At the very end of the Old Testament, Malachi, it says, Bring your tithes into the storehouse, that there may be found food in my house. And try me in this, says the Lord. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessings, that there will not be enough room to receive it. It's the nature of God to give us those blessings. It's the nature of God to want to give us more than we could ever have. More than we could ever need. But there's a side to that. There's part of it that we have to do ourselves. Turn to Matthew. Matthew 7, verses 7 to 11. Can I start reading this? You're going to say, oh, yeah, I know that passage. Matthew 7, verses 7 to 11. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. For what man is there among you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children... How much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask Him? You know, the funny thing is, is this ask, seek, knock? It's written in the present tense, in the continual motion. In other words, He's saying, you knock, keep knocking. He's saying, keep asking, keep seeking. These things are out there. God wants to give them to you. But if you're like Joash and you only knock three times... Are you going to give up on God? God won't give up on you. He wants you to have good things. In Luke 6, 38, Jesus says it this way. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. The same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. If you use a cup, you'll get a cup. If you use a bucket, wonderful, you'll get a bucket. But if you're doing that, and you're a child of God, and you're seeking, and you're asking, and you're knocking, when you use a cup, God will use a ladle. When you use a ladle, God will pour blessings out of a bucket. If you're willing to pour blessings out of a bucket, God will pour them back on you from a trough. All things are God's. He wants, it, it's the nature of God to bless us. The sad thing is, so many people turn this around into just money. And it's so much more than that. Sure, when you give money, sometimes money comes back, sometimes it doesn't. But I guarantee you when you give love, love will return. I guarantee you if you give friendship, you'll get friendship in return. If you give joy, you'll get joy in return. If you give sweat, people will be willing to sweat for you back. That's the nature of people. This, this, this idea goes so far beyond just money. And it saddens me when people truncate this principle of God into something so petty as mere money. 
You know, everything God gives us is more than enough. Everything He's already given us is more than enough. Think about the Bible. The very words of God, the, 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 the thoughts of Jesus in our hands, it's enough. Romans 15, 4 says, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort that the Scriptures might have hope. Even the Old Testament is written for us. And it's enough. In 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instructions in righteousness. Why? That the man of God might be complete, thoroughly equipped, for every good work. Is there a good work out there? The Bible will equip you for that good work. Is there righteousness to be found out there? The Bible will equip you for that righteousness. Is there truth out there? The Bible will equip you to find that truth. All things we need, God has given to us generously in the Bible. It's all there. You don't need creed books. You don't need commentaries. You don't need a priest telling you how it works. It's there for us to read. Not only is the Bible enough, even better than that, the blood of Christ is enough. More than enough to save everyone in this room, to save everyone in this town, this state, this country, this world. The blood of Christ washes over everyone in this world from past to present to future. The blood of Christ is more than enough. In Ephesians 2.13 it says, But now in Christ Jesus you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And who's Paul talking to there? Gentiles. Who? Us. People who were separated from Christ. People who were separated from God by their sin. Jews who put their faith in the temple system and the law of Moses. You have been brought near by the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ is enough for us. In 1 John 1, 7 it says, But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. What cleanses us from all sin? Our hopes, our dreams, what we do, our work. No, the blood of Christ. It's enough. It is enough to cleanse us from everything. Jesus, while he was holding the very cup, that cup that we participate in today in the Lord's Supper, Matthew 26, 28 said this, For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remissions of sin. How many? How many? A couple? This is my blood, which is shed for a few for remission of sins. For a couple for the remission of sins. For many. Everyone. Everyone. The blood of Christ is enough to save us. The question kind of, kind of comes down to, is your cup large enough? His cup is plenty large. The cup of the Lord is more than large enough to overflow with us. But is our cup large enough to receive those blessings? Is our cup large enough? You know, if you start, if you have a glass of water and you have and you start putting marbles in the water, what happens eventually? Eventually the marbles will start to displace the water. This is a simple scientific principle. And eventually the water will start flowing off the top because you kept putting marbles in. If your cup is like that cup with water being filled up with marbles, and you're putting in sin, now I'm not talking about the big sins. I'm not talking about murder and, 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 and adultery and fornication or even idol worship. Oh, you know, not the, not the great big sins. I'm talking about are you putting the little bitty sins in your cup? White lies. It's just a little white lie. It's okay. Worry. Are you worrying all the time? Are you worrying instead of turning it over to God? 
Are you putting the worry in your cup? Having an unforgiving spirit? These things take up the space in your cup. And if these things are taking up the space in your cup, do you think God can pour the blessings in your cup? If your cup is full of anger and wrath, can God pour His blessings into your cup? And that's the, and that's the putting the wrong thing in our cup. Eventually our cup is full of the wrong thing. The wrong things. Instead, we have to be filling our cup with the graces, the Christian graces which are spoken of in 1 Peter. Faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, charity. These are the things that when we put them in our cup, we become more like God. These are the things that help us become more like God. And when we put these things in our cup, and God pours the blessings in, what do you think is going to run out of our cup? Charity, kindness, temperance, faith, virtue? We shouldn't be putting the wrong thing in our cup. The interesting thing is, if that's the case, does what's overflowing your cup Bless those around you? Ask yourself that. Is the things that are overflowing from your cup matter to the people around you in a way that it blesses them? You remember God said, you know, try me in this. See if I won't open up the windows of heaven. What's one of the ways? What's one of the ways that he opens up the windows of heaven? When Jesus said, give and will be given to you, pressed down, shaken together, running over under your bosom. How do those things come to us? One of the primary ways is from other people. Because we deal with other people every day. Are you the person that people say, <laughs> no, it's all right, I don't want to be around that person. Because their cup is overflowing with anger and malice. Their cup is overflowing with, I don't want to be around you, spite. But if your anger, if, if your cup is overflowing with, with, with love and virtue and patience and temperance, knowledge of the God, people are going to want to be around you. And people are going to want to be around you so that you can bless them. You know, in Matthew 25, there's the, there's the parable of the unfaithful servant. And he talks there about the, the unfaithful servant and the whole idea is his cup overflowed with unused opportunities. He had an opportunity that he did not use. Do you want your cup overflowing with unused opportunities? In Ephesians 5, 15 and 16 it says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools but as the wise, Redeeming the time because the days of evil. If you go over to Colossians 4, 4, 5, it says the same thing. Redeeming the time. And that is just a euphemism, a way to say, a figure of speech. Take, take hold of your opportunities. If you're holding a cup that's full of anger and wrath and unforgiveness, your cup is not going to bless anyone. And no one's going to want to be around you to have part of those opportunities. If your cup is overflowing with love, justice, opportunities will present themselves. Isn't that a wonderful thing to think about? That the opportunities will present themselves? I want you to turn over real quick to uh, Romans 8. Romans 8, 31 to 39. You pretty much have the New Testament correlation... To the, to the passage in Psalms 23. Romans 8, 31, 39 says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen 
who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Well, that should give you the willies right there. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation, our distress, our persecution, our famine, our nakedness, our peril of the sword. And for it is written, for your sakes we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It is there a Testament passage that speaks to the same principle as Psalm 23 is right there. Who's going to separate us from the love of God? Paul says, I'm convinced that nothing will separate me from the love of God. Nothing will separate me from the love of God. Because when you're separated from the love of God, what do you think is coming out of your cup? Certainly it's not the love of God. Not the love of God. So what do we say to all this? What do you say to something like this? This is what David said. Psalm 116, 12 and 13. He said, What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits toward me? David says, what do I give back? All the things that God has given me, what do I give back? He says, I will take up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. David says, of all the things that God has done for me, I'll take up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. Thank you, Lord. I, let me partake in the cup of salvation, which again is overflowing and call on the name of the Lord how beautiful is that how wonderful is that to know that that cup of salvation that David took we can take in John 10:10, 10, 10, Jesus said the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy I have come that they us right that they may have life and that they might have it more abundantly the cup of salvation that David wanted to take up for all the, because of all the things that God had done for him. Jesus said, that same cup is fulfilled in me because I want to give you life and life more abundantly. How beautiful is the fact that the Bible does not leave itself without witness. How beautiful is it the fact that the Bible, it amazes me when people say, well, you know, there's, you know, people wrote the Bible. No, 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 no. God wrote the Bible through the Holy Spirit using the instrument of man. And you know how I know? Acts 22:16. Ananias, Paul is retelling the tale of when Ananias comes to him. And after Ananias comes to him and he's been, Paul's been laying there for three days without food, without water, praying. Wanting to be right with God. Paul recounts the words that Ananias spoke to him. He said, now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. What did David say? Because of what God did, I will take up the cup of salvation, calling on the name of the Lord. What was Ananias told Paul to do? Rise, wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Where is the cup of salvation? Washing away your sins. What is washing away your sins? Friends, the opportunity stands right behind me. In what we call a baptistry. Friends, the opportunity stands no matter where you go and there's a creek to wash away your sins. Friends, the opportunity stands if you go up to Smith Lake and you can wade out in there and get baptized to wash away your sins calling on the name of the Lord.